Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. I was going to give you a really great video on XDC tonight, uh, but my rabbit hole kind of <laughs> got too deep. And I so will have to finish that on another day. But I'm going to give you a lead because if you're a researcher and you like XDC, I want you to go down the same rabbit hole by following a Mario. Banque, E M E R I O B A N Q U E. There is something going on there. Anyway, I will finish that uh, deep dive, but if you want to jump ahead of me, that is the lead that I think will take you to the same place that I was very excited about. Okay, first, um, the market. We're kind of going sideways. We're sitting at 2.09 trillion and, uh, well, 15% of the crypto volume in the last 24 hours is currently in DeFi projects and tokens. So that is really playing out like I thought it would. I had said that I thought it was going to stay now on a consistent basis between 12 and 15%. And I do believe that by the time we get to the year's end or in the beginning of 2022, we're going to see that move to 20 percent well the project that's really standing out right now in the top 100 is tezos they're up 15 percent in the last 24 hours 53 percent in the last seven days 85 percent up on the month patience has really paid off for that project they had a recent upgrade which was very successful also the banks in the eurozone have chosen to tokenize on their platform and also they're they're getting a lot of good reviews for their high staking rewards so finally finally <laughs> that project is starting to pay off with all of the patience that it has required all right i'm going to just share with you some very interesting things on ripple the company xrp and odl yeah first we're going to look at something that i think is really rich <laughs> because the sec is in a real difficult situation here i would say they're in a pickle which is a phrase you use when you are in trouble what it is is they have well supposedly had a policy where you needed to pre-clear in order to engage in any securities tradings as an employee so if you were an employee of the SEC and you were going to trade, you had to make a pre-clearance before you did that. Okay, so what it looks like is the SEC did not restrict its employees from buying or selling XRP. Well, at least they are refusing to even come up with any of the information that is being asked of them. And the interesting thing is, is the reason why I think they are refusing to come up with anything is because if, 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 if the SEC was allowing their employees to trade XRP and they didn't require a preclearance, well, then XRP wasn't a security, right? Because you couldn't allow your employees unless you didn't follow your own policy to trade xrp i think also likewise this is supporting ripple's fair notice defense in a huge way and ripple doesn't need to know the names that's not exactly what they are asking for uh, they just want to know whether or not it was traded and was it authorized to be traded so did the employees have permission? The SEC is refusing to answer. Ripple just needs to know the amounts that were held, bought, sold on an annual basis. That's all they're asking for. You can see on the form here, they ask it for not only XRP on the purchase, uh, on the what was denied as for asking pre-approval, uh, what sales occurred, and also what sales were denied, along with BTC and Ethereum. But that motion <laughs> that went through to compel the preclearance trading documents that they're asking, I think this is the third time they have asked for that. 
So did the SEC allow its employees to be market participants? That's the million dollar question. And if they did, then that was during the very same period that Ripple is accused of breaking the law. Do you see what kind of trouble the SEC is in here? And if we take a look at what Jeremy put out, he really is leaning towards no settlement anytime soon. Have a listen to how he explains that. It's a long story. The problem with a settlement between now and November 12 is that the parties won't know how strong each side's position is until after discovery closes. So even if we are looking at a slap on the wrist settlement of millions of dollars, it's kind of funny to say, how many millions are we talking about? 10, 20, 200, 1,000? You think that Ripple isn't going to care about the difference between paying $20 million versus $200 million? I think any business cares about that and is willing to wait an extra couple months in order to potentially save millions of dollars. And from the SEC side, how can it settle without knowing the fate of its motion to strike Ripple's fair notice defense? The SEC's Queen's Gambit has put a lot of weight on that motion, and it's still not resolved, and the judge has not told us when she's going to make a decision on it. So we're still waiting on that now. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, I think that's where we're at. And if you want to listen to Andrew Saraceni, he is uh, now on the team defending Ripple, but ironically enough, he was a director at the Securities and Exchange Commission in the Division of Enforcement from January 2014 to 2016. And I took a clip of where he talks about how the culture was, which for him, he believes that it was one of the uh, best places to work and that it actually had some uh, ratings that came back that increased while he was there. So he has a good memory for working there. I think that has since changed. But if you want to listen to this, as I'm going to keep it moving on this particular video, that is on my Twitter feed. What I want to do here is just talk briefly about how on-demand liquidity works. Uh, I, I do think a lot of people might feel a little blurry about this. This is the use case that the digital asset XRP is used in bridging from one fiat to another. And what it really does is it eliminates the requirement to have that correspondent banking partner, partner whereby you have trillions, there are trillions of dollars that are tied up in capital around the world to fulfill that correspondent banking partner relationship, which is a very old model. And it just doesn't need to be done that way anymore. And this is very, very simple. One, two, three, four steps. You can see that in the blue lines, that is RippleNet. And in the lines that are in this kind of light gray, this is not Ripple, this is a non-Ripple entity, usually a market maker or an exchange or somebody who is providing and facilitating that digital asset XRP to become the liquidity. So it comes out of the wallet. This is an XRP wallet. So this is um, something that is held by the sender. They send it to the facilitator. It then goes over the XRP ledger. And when it is received in the other wallet on the other side of another country, it is then converted into the local fiat. And then, of course, it is sent to the receiver, which then distributes it out to the beneficiaries as needed. So that is how the on demand liquidity actually. Goes. I thought that was a really great, um, uh, I'm always in the way. I thought that was a really great graphic because I think it's easy to understand. And if you are following this project, Ripple rebranded all of their services back in 2019. And you can see that when they did change from kind of these X based individual products, they then turned everything into the network infrastructure called RippleNet. And depending on the specific corridor and, of course, that liquidity, the framework 
to get into on-demand liquidity, ODL is an option. Okay. I know. I just want to be sure that everybody is getting that information. Even if you go on to the Ripple website, you can see that it is the most reliable option for sourcing liquidity on demand. This is the digital asset XRP. So if we jump to October 2020, you can see that RippleNet at that time was in 55 countries. I'm sure it's much more now. And XRP ODL was running in just five regions at this time, US, Mexico, Europe, Philippines, and Australia. And then I had the CEO of FlashFX on, in, on the channel in July, and that was Nicholas Steger. And he announced at that time that on-demand liquidity for him was going to open up from Australia to the UK. And then we also have just about three or four weeks later, the announcement on the 27th of July that gave us the very first corridor of on-demand liquidity from the Japanese company, SBI Holdings. Yes, Japanese company. They are also the largest outside shareholder of Ripple, and they are not associated with the State Bank of India. It is also abbreviated SBI, so some people get it mixed up. But SBI Holdings is in Japan, and it is led by Mr. Yoshitaka Kitao, which if you're on Twitter, he is one that you need to follow because he's got a very active SNS manager <laughs> and he's very in tune with what's going on. So what I want to play for you now is something that talks about ODL and this is a little earlier in the year and we're going to hear from Neom which is a Ripple partner and also an on-demand liquidity user. And this is an interesting video. It's available for anyone to watch out there. Um, it is, uh, you know, just something you have to um, just enter your email and uh, it's an on-demand video. And this was one of the guests that spoke and he's talking with the part that I'm going to play for you is where he is talking about Ripple. You can see here ODL with the sender institution and Neom. And it's very interesting because he talks about working in multiple geographies using Ripple and ODL and how they can send the money in real time and where they can go live. And he names some new corridors like Malaysia, India, and Turkey. I have not had an official announcement that I know of for those regions, but um, he talks about how they are. Uh, going live and integrating with ODL and their fiat infrastructure in those areas. So we have uh, some more countries that are opening up. Uh, let me just play this portion here for you. Uh, and then I, I wanted to kind of spend some time on, on this particular slide where we basically have are building a, a solution with Ripple uh, which basically helps you send into multiple, uh, multiple, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, multiple geographies, which we are enabling using uh, Ripple and ODS, uh, by which you know we we become a provider. Uh, in real time, you can move money from one end to the other, uh, where we have seamlessly integrated with with Ripple's ODL with our fiat uh, uh, infrastructure. And, and we are able to kind of uh, make, give you real time quotes and also to make real time delivery uh, on the receive side at a very, very, uh, uh, within seconds if, if, if we have real time payments available in that country. So for example, a gig worker in India can be play, paid out uh, from Europe uh, within, within minutes or within, uh, within seconds depending upon uh, what kind of accounts they have. So this is something that we are excited about. We are opening up a few countries uh, with Ripple, Europe, US, um, uh, you know, Malaysia, uh, um, uh, India, as well as 
Turkey, some countries that we can go live, and also you know all our hundred countries are available over a period of time uh, to be used uh, if you want to move forward. So that's that's exciting for us. That's something that uh, I think uh, a lot of players, uh, a lot of people on this call would find it interesting because it opens up uh, usage of ODL to more geographies than than currently available, and that's something that we are uh, we we are very very happy about. So in summary, you know, we we are a platform which offers you uh, really fast integration, allows you to issue cards in multiple geographies. It allows you to collect money in various geographies. It allows you to send money seamlessly across more than hundred countries, uh, and most of it either in real time or 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 in a few minutes. At any point of time, the platform is built in such a way that you know where your money is. And and you know uh, at any point of time that your money is secure. Uh, we are uh, we are one of the fastest growing fintechs in the world. And yeah, he just goes on. So this is a very interesting portion, isn't it? Um, I just think we have to wait for some official announcements. But it sounds like ODL is really building out. Neom is a very good partner. All right, I will also tell you that the ripple swell, yeah, we should see some registration process open up soon, summer 2021. Stay tuned for more information. It's going to happen in November this year, but uh, I think we should probably see that registration come up pretty soon. It'll be probably all virtual, but who knows, maybe they'll do a combination like they're doing with Apex, possibly. Um, yeah, so if it is uh, something that they open their registration to, uh, give it a try because I know that last year there was a fair amount of people who were able to attend their online uh, virtual event. And this is from V for XRP. He's the one on Twitter that loves to put the <laughs> echo green eyes on everybody. And he this is not my doing. This is where he has put my my Echo Eddie green eyes on OpenSea as an NFT. <laughs> it's funny. I think it's really funny. Anyway, he is he is fun to watch on Twitter. He is always doing something very interesting. And then I just have just something very simple for you, and that is in Japan there are many, many of these cat cafes. Some of them are quite nice, quite big. This one's in Shinjuku in the, the area called Kabukcho. And uh, look at how nice and big it is. But this is the part I wanted to show you. This is feeding time. And this is really a popular time to be there. Look at all of these cats. I counted, there's 24 of them. And they are just unbelievably well behaved too. Look at that little uh, Scottish fold walking in front. But they all just line up and eat their food like like they were trained. Isn't that funny? How funny is that? I know even if you're not a cat person, you have to be a little bit amazed. I don't think they just must be, this must be their routine. So look at the face on that one. Oh, this, I have not been to this particular cafe, but the uh, cat cafes are quite popular because there's so many people who live in buildings that don't allow animals in the city. So it is a way to uh, enjoy a feline friend. All right, everybody. I just thought that was great. Do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.